everybody, welcome to episode number 53 of my series of live stream guided tours through Paris for free, coming at you every weekend. Uh, each episode is designed to bring you to a different part of town, uh, hopefully show you some stuff that you haven't uh, discovered quite yet, or perhaps you don't know the story behind. And so welcome, this is it, my name's Corey Fry. If you can't bring yourself to Paris right now, I'm gonna bring it to you. That's the philosophy of this whole series. Hello, I can see all the bonjours coming in with my live audience. Otherwise, I guess you're listening on the replay and thank you for that. And I'm standing here in the middle of a charming little cobblestone street in the 13th arrondissement. The 13th arrondissement is a very local one. It's um, farther outside of the center of town. And it's really the perfect place uh, to, to get away from things and to tap into what I would call the, the, the old village past of the city. And you can see right away this gorgeous architecture that just gets me tingly just looking at it. Hello, everybody. I can see Texas, Texas is in the house in California and all around the world. And Tara ba uh, back is here. So let's jump right into it. Let's make our way down the street. I want to talk about the, the name of this uh, episode is the Invisible River Tour. I can see Phyllis Cartwright saying I love it already. Yeah, this is really a fun discovery today. The Invisible River Tour. Why would I call it that? Well, for a couple of reasons. First of all, we're going to follow the path today of a long forgotten hidden river from Old World Paris. It actually used to run along these beautiful buildings that you can see here. Um, and we'll talk more about that. But Imagine this river, it actually is even older than Paris itself. Going back over 2,000 years, the original Parisian settlers used the river. Uh, later, the Romans did here on the left bank, and then later on in medieval times, Renaissance period. And I want to show you, just to set the mood here, I brought a little visual that can hopefully... Look at that. So it was an incredible bucolic pastoral setting. I hope it's not too dark for you. So imagine that in the 13th arrondissement for hundreds of years, this is what this area looked like. So it was trees, cottages, birds chirping, vineyards, uh, water mills. There were women washing laundry. There were um, just, just an incredible pastoral scene. And you would have, um, in the winter, it would freeze here. The ice would be, f with the, the water would freeze and they would ch uh, carve out those chunks of ice and bury them underground for the summer months. Let me show you this beautiful uh, chapel tower. Let me pull out another image that I brought for you because I think you're going to get a kick out of this. So the river isn't here anymore, or is it? That's why I've called it the Invisible River Tour. And the sun's coming out. It's been raining for days on end. But the sun decided to come out in the blue skies just, I think, for this video. I think it was meant to be. So here's some fun. This is what I live for right here. This is why I've got the best job in the world. Take a look at this painting from the 18... 30s. Can you make that out? And then look at this beautiful tower. So again, I'm standing where there used to be a river for hundreds, thousands of years running through southern Paris. And that little tower right there was portrayed in that painting right there. Hopefully, hopefully you can make that out. I love it, I love it, I love it. So let me tell you more about this river. So it was a very charming uh, atmosphere back in the day, of course. But then in um, 1516, especially the 1700s, uh, in the 1800s, the industry moved in here uh, along the river. And so what you got is a bunch of, um, you had fabric dyers, you had uh, leather smiths and paper mills, and they were dumping all of their byproducts into the river. And so it turned into quite a cesspool. And um, we're going to talk about why the river isn't here anymore is because it got so nasty. But we're going to make our way down. This is the path of that former river. And I'll give you the name of it in a minute. But after I, I decided on the title for this episode, The Invisible River Tour, I just randomly found this that someone had written. And what it says is, I'll back up. It's a little faded on the left, but it says, Rare, no, invisible, yes. Look at that. Rare, no, invisible, yes. What a very fitting little piece of temporary graffiti there. Uh, for our episode. So uh, here we go. The industry came through mostly the 1800s and they were dumping in all of their terror. We had tanneries and the fabric dyers and the paper mills and there was gunpowder and excrement and urine being dumped into the river. So they decided they had to shut it down and they had to bury it. They submerged the entire river. So that's one reason I call it the invisible river here because it is not only can you trace the path of where it once was, but it still exists. It's just not visible. 
and I'm going to show you the name of it here because what we can do when we walk along here in the 13th arrondissement, every now and then I'm going to show you. This says the old bed, the former bed of the Bièvre, La Bièvre. That was the name of the river for thousands of years that ran through. Now they buried it in 1912. They decided it was just too disgusting and now it's actually running underground and these little plaques tell us. In fact, what it says here is the buildings that have been placed here follow the curve of the former river and it's still flowing into the sewer as we speak. And so let's go ahead and follow that. We're gonna make our way down the street. And if you follow the old path of the forgotten invisible river, the Bièvre, it will lead you to some interesting things. For example, this beautiful street art mural. Stunning, the name it says 2013 and the artist is Seth, S-E-T-H. And there's a nice little park there. Uh, a very leafy village vibe in this part of the 13th arrondissement. And then just one, one more look back at where we started. Again, if you're just joining me, we're in the 13th arrondissement following the path of, a, of an invisible river. Someone just asked what street it is. It's called the Rue Berbier du Met. I'll, so, I'll show you. Or Berbier du Met. That's our street. Let me show you another image. If I can get out of my pocket here. So if you Google uh, the Bièvre, uh, sorry, it's windy. Ugh. I'm doing my best, but oh la la. Oh la 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 la, of course, the, the gusts of wind start up. So anyway, you can see that it was major industry along this narrow little river. It was only 10 feet wide or three meters wide, this river at any given time. You can see it there where my thumb is. But let me zoom in. Do you see right there where there are these slats horizontally across the, the, the building right there? They're still here, look. It's incredible. They were drying racks. Again, let me show you again this old photo, if you can make it out, those horizontal slats. Try to get a little bit of sunlight on this. And then they're still here, so hopefully you can get the, the general idea. Uh, so you would, I don't know exactly the process, but when you were dyeing fabrics back then along the river or dyeing wool or yarn, you had to dry them and hang them out here. So of course they're not being used anymore. These are just residential buildings, but isn't that fantastic that the racks have, have survived in parts of this architecture. The street lamps are rather cute here too. If you can make those out. So yes, welcome to the Invisible River Tour. And as we make our, our way along, I'll point out some more markers that show us and prove that the Bièvre is running beneath our feet still today. That bras vif means that it's still the living um, uh, branch or the living arm of the river, as opposed to a dried up branch. And we're facing north now. This, um, the Bièvre would have made its way into the Seine. The original idea was that it would bring fresh water into the Seine in the center of town. Margaret Croft's asking where, a lot of questions coming in now. Uh, Margaret Croft asked where the, where the river goes. I mentioned earlier, Margaret, that it goes into the sewer. It used to dump into the Seine and now the sewer. So I won't show you every single plaque, but you get the idea that you walk here in the 13th of Small and you get that reminder. Very subtle though, you know, it has that great sort of treasure hunt vibe to it. Ooh, there's a beautiful little leafy, leafy section that we're headed to. But first, let me show you a little bit later, I'm gonna take you up the street and there is again, that great leftover village vibe. And my goodness, there's some good stuff there. So, but let's continue. Follow the path of, of the Bièvre. Here, I wonder, it doesn't say anything about the river, but if you notice, it says O, oh, which is water. And then you see this here. This is a little aqueduct symbol. Very rarely do you see those here 
on these little pla this actually opens so you can access water so does that little aqueduct um, represent the river like can you get water from the river is that what that's all about I don't know that's a mystery for us to figure out so imagine the the Biev flows through this way and it leads us to this beauty sorry I was yanking on my own mic cord look at this Oh, yeah. So we'll talk about that building in a minute. But here, we get a, a, a good juicy plaque here. So the Biev here, it says the river passed between numbers 12 and 14 of this boulevard, boulevard Arago. So that's number 12. And that's number 14. And that plaque tells us that the river flowed between them for thousands of years, even before Parisians even showed up to this place. Even before the Romans showed up, before anybody was here, the river flowed through what is now a little courtyard for the residents there. Hey, Hassan Manning, I see your name coming up again. Thanks, man, for that great comment. He says he can't wait to come back. I'm so glad I can inspire people to renew their love or just you know remind them just how fantastic the city is so again that's where we came from and the Biev would have flowed flown right through here we'll talk a little bit later about um, the industry that popped up along the river but here we've got to make a pause for some architecture there's a protestant church with some beautiful neo-roman uh, architecture uh, you could say that it's a architecturally this is sort of a a cousin of Sacré-Cœur in terms of bringing back some of those um, Neo-Roman and Neo-Byzantine elements. So, quite lovely. I haven't been inside this one. To my knowledge, it's still a functioning Protestant church. And let me zoom in on a few details for you. Just runs along here, the Boulevard Arago. Speaking of this boulevard, what a great place to have a little promenade. Again, I think a lot of travelers don't often make it out to the 13th arrondissement. But let me show you, for example, these, all of these sidewalks are big, they're clean, they're leafy, and it just goes on and on like that. Thanks everybody for joining me today. I'm excited to have you. This is a, an episode that I was really getting jazzed about. I think you saw that maybe on Facebook, the build-up. Uh, this is a 1901 building that we saw earlier, the Art Nouveau beauty. And uh, classic Art Nouveau, of course, would have used mosaics and ceramics and iron. Look at that right there. That's a screenshot, Peggy Michik, huh? Woo! Wow. Splendid, splendid, splendid. And then I already showed you this, but you can't walk by and not give it the up and down. And then lastly here, before we talk about the river again, there was a former church started in the year 1000 and then they re rebuilt it in the, mid the Middle Ages, but it's gone now. So we just have these little remnants above the doors that are reminders of that old church. Saint Hippolyte, or how however you would pronounce that. Hippolyte, maybe in French. And then look at that. So this is just a residential building, but there are leftovers of that medieval church. And onward, let's cross this street. You all have no idea it's been raining for like a week straight and I decided is it even worth scheduling a live tour because I know it's going to pour on me and frankly I'm sick of rain and hail and migraines and all of that stuff but I thought if I just keep a positive attitude and I schedule this thing as if nothing's going to go wrong then maybe the weather will work out and just as I turned on the camera the blue skies and the sun came in. This place is called Café Premier. Do not drink coffee here. It's one of the worst coffees I've had in 2019. Um, 
come here for the atmosphere, but not for the quality of the Java. And also come here for this fun detail. I've talked previously about how the original awnings of cafes would have iron bars that would be connected and held against the building, usually with lion heads. So when you see lion heads that are just on the side of the building at this level, usually they had iron rods sticking out of their mouths to hold the awnings. But here, I don't know if you can make it out, but I can tell you they are little devil heads. So not lions this time, but these little devilish pointy-eared dudes that used to hold up pre a previous awning of a previous cafe. And then you turn the corner and, oh yeah, here we're getting back to the village vibe. This area is surrounded by boulevards, but then when you cut into these side streets, you get stunning shots like this. So let me tell you about one of those fabric dyers that used to be along the Bievre. Um, it's the 1440s, right in the heart of the of Middle Age Paris, you know, uh, medieval Paris, I should say. And there's a guy called Jean Gobelin. And this area is actually called Les Gobelins after this guy and his family. So what he did was in the 1440s, he's dyeing fabrics. He did something, he discovered and perfected a, a technique that would make him uh, immensely famous and wealthy. And he found that an insect native to South and Central America called the co cochineal, um, he could grind it up and the cochineal bugs would get smushed, smushed up and their guts would make the most beautiful scarlet red dye uh, for fabrics and tapestries. And he perfected that process and he became famous for it. Nobody could make a beautiful, um, vibrant scarlet red like John Gobelin. So he, he did very well for himself and his family built this stunning uh, home in 1500, give or take a year. It's one of the oldest houses in Paris. What a great throwback. People are living in there now. And so, yeah, Jean Goublin did so well for himself and was so famous thanks to his work um, as a fabric dyer. And then later his family became uh, tapestry folks and they opened a big tannery. And so the whole complex of buildings in this area are thanks to the Goublin family. And as I said, the neighborhood, the nearby metro station, everything is named after that family. And then they built this. Oh, it's so glorious. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, everybody, there are 212 of you. I've got 424 eyeballs. And look at that, does it get any better? Let me tell you what's going on here. In fact, actually it does get a little bit better. Let me just pop you up over the gate. This is what makes the 13th arrondissement so special because there are many little nooks where you can find this kind of atmosphere. So what's going on here? This is called the Chateau de la Reine Blanche or the Hotel de la Reine Blanche or the White Queen. So why is it named after the White Queen? Historians have never really been able to agree on that. Uh, Saint Louis and one of our famous uh, King Louis, Saint Louis, his daughter lived in this area. Her name was Blanche, Blanche de France. Uh, so maybe they could come from her former residence. Also, it might come from the fact that um, all those uh, medieval and Renaissance uh, queens, they would wear, uh, when they were mourning the death of their husbands or family members, they would wear white. Now we wear black for mourning, but it used to be white. So maybe there was just a, a queen in this area that was mourning and dressed all in white. But anyway, at any rate, the name has stuck, Reine Blanche. So that actually isn't for a queen at all. It's for, a, um, for the Gobelin family. Again, this, this Gobelin family who got super wealthy rich or super stinky wealthy, however you want to say it, uh, they built that. And it was for, it was a tannery and it was for fabric dyeing and whatnot. I'm gonna show you another um, perspective. You can hear they're taking the trash today on the street. Yeah, someone just said makes for a great screenshot. It absolutely does. That's the Chateau de la Reine Blanche or the Hotel de la Reine Blanche. And then here, this used to be the headquarters for the French company of neon makers. Look at that. So it is, um, sorry for the garbage truck. The, it used to be the Compagnie Française du Neon. And that's what that all signage is for. And in fact, they must have been moving in uh, big, heavy loads of material because you notice here, imagine the delivery trucks and the carts. They came in, they always gouged out the corners, right? Look at this damaged. I know this is a, a random detail, but it, it shows you evidence of the industry and the fact that they would have been moving materials. It's all damaged on the corners. So yeah, that beauty, 
We'll see it from another angle in a minute. 1520 is when that was built by the Gobelin family. This one behind me, certainly not from 1520. Beautiful and so right, love that color. I think that might be, might be a home, might be a gallery, I'm not quite sure. And then here, look at this, I like this view. Look at a tiny, tiny little window. That's how you can tell this architecture is really ancient. Tiny little window. And then look at this, this used to be a home, right? The, the, the floor would have, those timbers. Floor sticking right out. I guess we would have in medieval times been standing in someone's living room. Uh, but that building's long gone and we just got the timbers jutting out there. Okay, let's try, let's try to get ahead of the garbage truck. This is bad timing. Although, let me show you this. I can't, I can't pass that up. Sponges and chamois. Look at that. Sponges and chamois, beautiful. You know, those leather chamois would have fit right in in this area where there were a bunch of tanneries. That's a, a hotel up top and an old facade. Let's try to get ahead of this truck. Bonjour, pardon. Oh no, the truck's moving. Ah, okay. Let's hope that thing doesn't follow us around. Because we're going to go down this street and i got to show you something special. <laughs> Sharon Peterson says, can I live on this street? I know, tell me about it. There's another garbage truck. My goodness, it is garbage day. So, the architecture here is charming, but I gotta show you what's around this corner. Ah, my mom says adorable streets. Absolutely, mom, I know. Look at this. Look at that. Wow. C'est bon, merci. So here is the same building that we were looking at, that Chateau de la Reine Blanche, the White Queen Castle. 1520, built by the famous Gobelin family, who made their fortune fabric dyeing and running tanneries and various things. So let me see. Do I have enough space? Yes. Walk you through. People actually live here now in this building, but they have, um, they've started an initiative, luckily, where they allow free tours to be given uh, certain times of the year. And I'll show you that sign where if you're here in July or in August, you can come in, you can get a free guided tour inside. Uh, what a beautiful moment just hidden away here. Uh, let me show you right here, by the way, the tower that we love. Um, this is kind of cute. The French call it une tour poivrière, and a poivrière is a, a pepper mill. So they named these old Gothic and Renaissance towers after pepper mills, which they obviously look like. And what's the case here, and is often the case, is there's a little spiral staircase, wooden spiral staircase that makes its way up, and that's how you access all of the various floors. And you see these beautiful things here. Sometimes people ask me about that. That's not just for decoration. That was literally to connect each floor or each ceiling to the wall. And so if you notice, if you look carefully, um, it happens just where the ceiling or the floor uh, would attach to the wall. Hopefully that makes sense. And in this case, they're just stunning. And then when that was a tannery, um, this is where they would make, uh, do the leather smithing, the leather production. And you can see just gloriously old factory style buildings. Um, I can see a lot of people asking what street this is, etc. cetera. Um, I'll be putting it on the PDF map um, of this tour so you can see exactly where we are and where all these addresses are. So the tanneries would be doing their thing right here in this courtyard. You'd have these huge cauldrons with boiling water and they would um, they'd boil the, the hides right here. And then of course behind this is where we started our walk today, which means that that Bièvre, that former river, the invisible river that was buried underground, used to flow on the backside of these buildings. And of course that was all the water they needed for their industry. So that is 
the White Queen Chateau. Let me pop you back out through the gate and we'll finish up the public, oh, public version of this walk very soon. There we go. I promised you this. Chateau de la Reine Blanche, uh, guided visits. There you go, the 2nd to the 28th of July. Those are the hours and you can take a screenshot of that if you ever want to come through here and see what's inside. Highly recommend it. Let me show you the rest of this street too before we leave. You can almost forget that you're in Paris. We're in a major European capital with over 2 million people running around and a bunch of tourists running around and a bunch of garbage trucks driving around and you can find these glorious little villages. And then one last look here. Always got to take one last look. All right. Let me show you a couple more things and we'll wrap up the public version. Now, <clears throat> trying to, here we go. Hi, I just wanted to say hello. Check the hair real quick. Um, I wanted you to see the joy on my face. I'm so excited to show you this stuff. Uh, amazing discoveries in every arrondissement and we're just scratching the surface of the 13th uh, district here. Some people ask me, do you think you're ever, you're ever gonna run out of stuff to show people? And I can tell you absolutely not. We're just at episode number 53. I'm just getting started. Um, so if you want to become a Patreon member, if you wanna support this project and help it go further and help it develop and help just basically support my quest to discover all these nooks and crannies and find out the anecdotes and the cast of characters, then go ahead and use the link in the description of this replay. And um, you can become a Patreon member and get a lot of rewards in return. One of them is, let me switch back around. One of the rewards is you're going to get a tour extension, a private extended version of this live tour in a few minutes, only for my Patreon followers. And I've got extra fun, beautiful, bucolic village atmospheres to share with them. And a lot of other stuff that I won't get in, go into, but I just want to show you the village atmosphere here. Okay. Speaking of the village. Look at that. Try to focus. Wow, I so want to get back there. I so want to get back here. Okay, back to one of the major boulevards. And we're going to wrap things up. Another big, beautiful, leafy avenue. Let me show you this if you can make it out. Some of those beautiful old painted billboards, the advertisements. We've got, I think, layers of many different uh, billboards here. I can make out Hotel de Ville at the top. I can see the phrase toujours moins cher, which means always cheaper, always better price. I can see the word television, television, and the word gratuit. Uh, gratuit meaning friend, uh, free. So that's charming. Uh, Jennifer Warren says that she votes that I should be allowed all the codes to the gates and the doors of Paris. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, for now, we'll have to just um, be grateful for the ones that we can access. For example, here, um, we're on the Avenue des Gobelins, and here at number 40 and 38. here. Make that out. So these are a couple of offices. I think there's a notary office here. But um, yeah, this is what it's all about, right? Very cool. Very cool indeed. Love these lamps. Mm -hmm. 
So to bring our story to its conclusion, I want to show you this beautiful palace <clears throat> that carries on the tradition of the Gobelin family of tapestries and fabric dyeing and furniture making. But let me show you this in honor of a French resistance fighter fallen during Second World War Nazi occupation. And I love, how, I love it when they do this. Here fell gloriously, gloriously fell for the liberation of Paris. I love how they use that word. But this is what's so amazing, and this is why Paris gets to me. It's so visceral. Uh, you can see this plaque, and you can contemplate this poor guy who died in 1944. But then all of a sudden you notice, wait, is that a bullet hole? And then you come over here, and you can almost hear the gunfire just play out in your imagination. Bop, 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 bop. These are all the bullet holes that eventually would have taken that gentleman out. Just extraordinary. Here are some, uh, some real decent ones. Look, put my finger in here. Look at that. So obviously the history's all around. One up there too. So you, sometimes you see these plaques and you think, okay, well that guy got shot down by the Nazis. But then you see the actual bullets on the side of the building that, that took the guy out. And that is pretty moving stuff. Let's finish here with a courtyard and a palace. Again, I'm gonna poke this through. Hopefully the security, security guards won't mind. I'll tell you about who that statue is there that we can see in the center. But up there, you, you probably can't read it in the dark, but it says that Louis XIV's minister in the 1660s, his name was Colbert, you probably heard of Minister Colbert, decided to group together all of these artisans along the river Bièvre along that invisible river. And he was going to create this huge sort of umbrella, umbrella project where all the artisans would create the finest tapestries and rugs and paintings for Louis XIV and for Versailles. So in fact, most of Versailles, the reason it's so beautiful is because of this factory, again, going back to that old family name of Les Gobelins, the Goblin family. Um, if you can make it out in the center of your screen, there's a statue of Lebrun. He was the painter of Versailles who did all those beautiful interior ceilings and whatnot. And he was the manager of this complex um, for a long time. It's called La Manufacture des Gobelins. Look at that beauty right there. Hello, beauty. And that company, the factory that Colbert built to crank out those beautiful works of art for Versailles um, is still today in operation for almost 400 years. And this is the palace. This is where, this is the HQ of La Manufacture des Gobelins. And the metro station here is called Les Gobelins. The avenue is named Gobelin. And it's all because of that one guy in the 1440s, Jean Gobelin, along the invisible river of the Bièvre, which is still secretly running beneath our feet here in the 13th arrondissement. He got the bright idea to crush up some little cochineal insects, and it gave him the most beautiful crimson, scarlet, red dye that anyone had ever seen. And it made him wealthy and famous, and his entire family thrived and flourished because of it. And then later, Louis' minister Colbert builds this version of Les Gobelins. So we're gonna wrap things up here today. I hope you enjoyed this tour through the 13th arrondissement along the invisible river, the Bièvre. And I hope you can come here yourself one day and contemplate all these lovely details. In the description of this video, you're going to see links to various things. I'm a photographer, you'll see a link to my Instagram. I'm a full-time tour guide, you'll see a link to, um, to book a tour with me in Paris when you're here. If you wanna see me in person, if you wanna dig in deep into one of these neighborhoods with me, go ahead and do that. I can be reached for tours. And then Patreon, if you wanna support this, if you want to help this quest, it really is a quest. I feel like it is. It's a noble one too, if, if, I, you, know, if you ask me. And so if you want to help me continue this series, go ahead and pop on Patreon and pledge something monthly to help me out and support me. And I promise I will give you lots of rewards in return, including the tour extension. I'm going to switch this off. If you are a Frit, if you're a Patreon member, go over to our private Facebook group and I'm going to show you some, some more beautiful stuff, okay? So why don't we finish with some sort of glorious view of this palace. Something like that. And thanks everybody. I'm going to bid you a wonderful Saturday. Have a nice weekend. And remember, if you can't bring yourself to Paris, I'm gonna bring Paris to you.
Have a lovely day, folks. Take care. Au revoir. A bientôt.